Hey, welcome to the Entrepreneur Experiment Podcast with me, Gary Fox. This is the podcast for you if you want to understand the secrets and systems world-class founders use to build their business, their body, and their brain. I've got a massive announcement to share with you today. If you're watching on YouTube, you can already see we have a brand new studio. Our new Entrepreneur Experiment Studio is the private cinema located at the Greenway from Iconic Offices. It is a beautiful venue. You can even hear it in the sound. Feel how rich that is. It's a beautiful private cinema located right in the heart of Stevens Green. So thank you to Iconic Offices for being an incredible partner. Today, I'm talking to Eamon Fitzgerald, the founder of WineSpark. He's turned his passion into his dream life and dream career. There's not many entrepreneurs that can truly say that. Eamon is nuts about wine. He lives it, he breathes it, and he's managed to turn this into a beautiful business called WineSpark. We hear about how he went to the UK, partnered up with Naked Wines to become their MD, before spending 10 years there learning the intricacies of the business before coming home and setting up WineSpark. This is a beautiful story about passion and about following your dreams. Here is my chat with Eamon Fitzgerald, the founder of WineSpark. If you're a regular listener of the pod, which I hope you are, you'll know I've been hosting the podcast from Iconic Offices for quite a while now, and things have gone really, really well. So well, in fact, that I'm now a member of Iconic Offices, working and recording from one of their spaces. This means I can vouch for the benefits it gives to any business. On that note, Iconic Offices have given me a number of exclusive complimentary day office trials from my audience. So try it out for yourself for the day, bring your team, no catches. Simply go to the web link in the description and enter Gary23, so it's Gary23, to claim your complimentary office for a whole day. It's a pretty fantastic offer. Thank you, Iconic Offices. Eamon, welcome to the pod. Thanks for having me, Gary. You are our first guest in our brand new home. That well, feels nice to be here. It's good, isn't it? We did a live pod here a couple of weeks ago, and now we're back. We've moved permanently into the iconic cinema. So welcome. You're our very first guest. You're our debut guest in the new home. <laughs> no pressure, then. No pressure. We'll make it a good one. <laughs> Eamon, you are about to disprove a lot of theories people have because you are turning your passion into your business. What do you do? Yeah, so I make great wine accessible and affordable to Irish wine drinkers. I uh, started a company called WineSpark uh, two years ago. And um, in that time, we've uh, grown to uh, over a thousand members. And um, yeah, we've, we've got to two years uh, in the last couple of weeks and still alive. So uh, that's yeah, a big feel, landmark. Feels we, like an achievement. We chatted about that over, over coffee. Uh, two years is an achievement. One year is always the one people talk about, but two years. If you're in business, two years is the one where you're like, oh, that little breath goes out and you realize you've kind of got over that big hurdle. What did it feel like? Yeah, it's a bit like that difficult second album because in year one, you know, uh, you get great press, you're new, you're exciting, friends and family pile on and, you know, you win awards and all that stuff se seems to come kind of easy and you almost start to believe your own bullshit that you might be quite good at this. Uh, and then year two hits and a lot of that stuff dries up and you need to really kind of knuckle down and start to, to, to prove out the business. So yeah, to reach year two feels feels like an achievement and we're I feel like we're very well placed to succeed in year three and, and beyond. So year two is often the one that people don't be self-aware enough about and they don't actually realize what happened in year one isn't going to be the same in year two and you know you're not the hot young thing anymore so how have you kind of changed your thinking about that i think a big part of it is actually maintaining your thinking and having that strong conviction that what you're doing is actually going to work and is actually you know you know in my case i make great wines accessible and affordable you know i, I strongly believe that I'm, I'm the best person in ireland to do that and you know I've got the got a lot of happy customers who who seem to to, to back that up. So you've got to believe, you've got to have that strong conviction that you know what you're doing is the right thing, and that you know that that passion and that conviction will, will carry you through some of the tougher times. And when you say accessible and affordable, how does it work? Um, what does so, Linespark do? Yeah, so uh, w um, this kind of even before Wine Spark, I spent 10 years in the UK uh, running a big wine business over there called called Naked Wines. 
And I started there as the wine manager, grew to managing director, ended up a global wine director. And over that time, developed amazing contacts all over the wine world, all these great winemakers. Um, managed a business of, you know, grew it from 20,000 customers to 300,000 customers, wow. 150 people, you know, just big numbers in the end. So got great experience, um, you know, learning the wine industry and learning how to, to run my own business. And really got back to Ireland in 2019, just before COVID. And first thing I noticed was, wow, wine is quite expensive here <laughs> in this country. And yeah, then during COVID, lockdown happened, the travel stopped, and suddenly I was stuck at home, um, you know, working on Zoom like like everyone else. And, you know, as we as we kind of kind of headed out of that first phase one, you know, back in May 2020, I think it was, you know, kind of, we're, we're all stuck in a five kilometer uh, radius mm. of uh, c- c- couldn't leave our 5K. So we started doing drinks on our street every Friday night, um, like a lot of neighborhoods up and down the country. And because all the wine was coming to me rather than me traveling around, I started doing wine tastings on the street with our neighbors. And, you know, as I was pouring these great wines for people, I, I realized two things. One is I love sharing great wines with people. And two, you know, wine shouldn't be so expensive and intimidating uh, to regular people. And I knew that with all my contacts down the years and maybe a smart business model, I could, you know, make these great wines more accessible, more affordable. So you didn't come back from the UK with this in mind? Not at all. What no. brought you home? Um, kids, uh, family. You know, we'd uh, spent 10 years over there, um, wife Ruth, and we had two kids at the time and um, decided yet yeah, to, to, to come home. Like I think a lot of people do at the time, had, had a great time in the UK and, and make great memories and friends, uh, but felt like it was time to, to come home. And be Were closer. you still working in the UK job? Were you going so, to commute back and over? Or what was the plan? I, I was still working in the UK job, you know, a year before lockdown, I became global wine director. So I, I stopped being managing director because obviously what wasn't in person anymore. So global wine director, I was gone kind of two weeks and four wow. to South Africa, to the USA, to Argentina, to Australia, you know, all these great places uh, traveling everywhere but you know in hindsight it wasn't sustainable especially with a, a young family and I'd hit 10 years which is a kind of natural time to get to maybe start reflecting on things going what what is the next what is the next step and I figured you know in a wine market which I felt you know certainly on the premium end people were underserved you know the choice was intimidating and, and big prices were high you know something maybe I could do something about it so I never had that real entrepreneurial itch before that point I just felt like I saw a big gaping opportunity um, to to do something about it. And, I think uh, that's, that's a really interesting insight because a lot of people are like, oh, I'm not an entrepreneur. Mm. Oh, I, I'm, you know, people either build themselves as, oh, I was born like this, I'm definitely going to be an entrepreneur, <laughs> or, oh, no, it's not me. And then it really is everybody, though. I think it is the yawning gap. People are like, oh, when's the right time? I'm like, you'll know, though. Yeah. Because it's the people like you who are like, I just could not do it. Yeah, I, I wasn't that kid, you know, selling... Uh, you know, sweets out of the locker in school. I, I didn't have entrepreneurship in my family, um, but I got amazing experience kind of in my career from, from a young age, exposed to people who bigged me up and, uh, and encouraged me. And, like, you know, age 36, I felt like the time was right to, mm. to, to kind of take the plunge and, and go it alone. And Naked Wines, did you go in there because you're passionate about wines or how did you end up in that job? Yeah, so, I mean, the, the, the wine passion kind of starts qu- quite early on when I was like a teenager. Um, you know, we'd go on holidays to France with the family and you'd drive over in the ferry like you're about to do uh, on your holidays. And, um, and yep, yeah, dad would pack up the... The, the boot with wine on the way home and we'd be sitting on wine like child shaped wine boxes you know and the, <laughs> uh, you know, trying to fit as much wine as possible into every cubic centimeter in the, in, in the car and I remember just bringing that wine home and opening the bottles and you know looking at the label and seeing names like Santa Emilion and Gigondas and Chateauneuf de Pape and then I'd look at the wine books and find them on the map and learn a little bit about them I was, what I was a random 16. hobby it for was, a teenager it was, it was, <laughs> it was, it was strangely young, young to get into that but I just loved the the, the, the idea I love France I love speaking French and all that stuff um, and yeah that, that, I guess that the wine bug bit then and um, yeah then I had a wine job in college uh, um, when I and then yeah I worked for Accenture then um, coming out of college did the graduate program and you know just to, to get some kind of proper professional experience first and you know started grad pro- program in 2007 uh, just before everything went tits up with the economy um, but I remember early on you know started with an intake of 40 or 50 people everyone's super smart everyone came out of you know good college degrees and stuff and you, you're, you're trying to find an edge you're trying to find you know where you can improve and actually you know we go out for dinners like team dinners in nice restaurants and 
like people kind of vaguely knew I was into wine. I had this little wine blog on the side where, where I'd write about stuff. And, you know, when the wine list was handed, usually to the most senior looking person at the table, a senior executive or whoever, like they'd freeze because who likes getting handed the wine list in front of a group? Mm-hmm. And it would just be, ha- someone would go, oh, Eamon likes his wine. So it, like straight away, it's, it's, yeah. it's handed to me. And so I just realized straight off, oh, like I've, I've got maybe, not a superpower, but you know, something, yeah. you know, I've got something I, I can stand out with here. And um, The edge though, that's, that's the thing. The edge. That's uh, entrepreneurship and, and, you know, being a founder it often comes down to the edge, especially in your career, no matter what you're doing. And it's often not the thing you've done in college. People think, oh, I'll just go to a good college. Yeah, yeah but everyone's coming out of a degree nowadays. Yeah, Most people are coming out of masters. So where is the edge? And often it's in your passion. Exactly. It's in your, what is that thing you just would do for free? You're doing it already. You're blogging about it. Yeah. yeah. So you were doing it anyway. Exactly. Um, so what was the next step then for you in a, after a century? Did you go right now? It's time to follow the passion or how did you get into Naked Wines? Yeah, so I, I moved over to the UK with Accenture, got a project with a, with a bank over there and took out a subscription with a, a small startup company called Naked Wines at the time and um, went along to a tasting. Uh, I wrote up a review of the tasting on the blog uh, afterwards. And then, you know, a couple of days later, I got an email from a guy called Rowan Gormley, uh, who's the founder of Naked Wines at the time. And said, "Hey, I love what you wrote there. Do you want to want to meet for a beer?" And um, ironic, I met him for a beer. Yeah, exactly, met him for a beer or two uh, a few days later. And yeah, four months later, I was working with him, wor- working for him up in Norwich. Uh, so That's class. He convinced me. That is kinda, class. Yeah, over the space of like about two pints to go to go work for him. And at this point, naked, we're we're two years in. Um, and yeah, became the the what my title was a wine development manager, which was essentially. We've got this insane growth that we don't have enough wine to, to keep up with growth. Can you get on a plane and fly to anywhere that makes wine, find <laughs> some talented winemakers and you know, bring some wine back home with what you? What age were you? I was 25 at the time. What did you think um, when he offered you that job? Uh, I first said, let me think about it because very mature I, I was living in london at the yeah. time and i was you know living the dream you know going to theaters at the weekend and you know out on the piss with my mates um and you know he was trying to tempt me to, to come up to norwich so i did the london to norwich commute it's only about two hours in the train did that a couple of times a week spent a couple of times up there and every few months he'd, he'd email me he's like when are you moving up here when are you going to live here and i was like no i'm just still having fun down in london and you know i'll, I'll come back to you on that and a year later then, he, he went off to the U.S. to set up Naked Wines in, in California. And he promoted me to managing director. Um, wow. Because he obviously saw something in me. What, which 27? I, uh, yeah, which I didn't wow. see myself. And um, it, then he put, yeah, I accepted the, 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 the offer. It was an email conversation. And he goes, oh, by the way, I presume you're moving to Norwich now. <laughs> so I was like, yeah, you, you got me there. I, I can't say no. And uh, yeah, that, that was an amazing journey. Um, and yeah, very, very quickly, you know, taking the reins of a business that, you know, had, we had probably had about 30 people at the time, 20,000 customers, about 30 million pounds turnover was was tough at start at the start uh, because thrown into it, no experience of managing a team, let alone. How did you approach that? Let's let's go down to the, the micro or oh, just to, I think what you did there is really interesting. I think the blogging and then the the passion and the passion and the passion and then the opportunity comes. Mm. I think people often overthink it going, oh, I really want to work in sport. Mm. And I often ask, well, what are you doing? Mm. Oh, no, I just want to work in sport. I'm like, are you doing anything? Are you, are you blogging? Are you creating a yeah. social media account? Oh, no, I just want to work in sport. I'm like, that's never going to happen. It's never going to knock on your front door. I think it's what you did is just taking the steps because you never know. Yeah. You never know what is the blog post or the podcast that just suddenly opens that door. What, how did you approach being promoted to managing director at 27? Like, what did you think? Talk me through how you actually handled that step up. Mm, pretty badly, I'd say. Um, so, you know, my comfort zone was, you know, being told to get on a plane to New Zealand, find an incredible winemaker making delicious Sauvignon Blanc or Pinot Gris and come back with it, you know, and, and I'd find a great winemaker, I'd write a brilliant story about it, and we'd sell loads of wine and build a relationship that way that, that's lasted for years. And I think I made the same mistake that a lot of people do when they go into a big job or succeed someone, uh, you know, succeed someone, you know, who, who, who was doing well before that. And bear in mind, Rowan, he, he, he set up three businesses for Richard Branson at Virgin uh, before setting up Naked Wines. If okay. you read Richard Branson's book, He'll say he used to get up, he used to get Rowan up on stage 
because he was so charismatic and entertaining. Whereas Richard would be like sit, sitting kind of th- th- down by the side because you know he just he knew Rowan was mad. So yeah, you're following this very charismatic, impressive, inspirational entrepreneur. So the first mistake I made was I tried to do the exact same thing, right? And um, yeah, and, and I remember it, the real, it kind of really came to a head. You know, I, I, I went down, you know, you, you do it, you kind of, you, you get through. And, um, but I, I was asked to speak at a, a marketing festival down in London. Um, this is a few months into the job. And, you know, it's a good experience. I'm a bit of an introvert, so public speaking, like, generally terrifies me. Uh, but, you know, you throw yourself into these mm-hmm. things and, and, and you get through them. Uh, but I remember speaking at this marketing festival about the story of, of the company and how we'd grown to that point. And, you know, I was about seven minutes into a 15-minute talk in front of 500 people. And I looked down at someone in the front row and uh, they looked kind of bored or they weren't listening. You know, they just looked distracted or whatever. And it threw me. Yeah. And suddenly I, the mouth went dry. I started to stutter and I lost my train of, th- th- train of thought. And I froze in front of 500 people on stage. Oh, and it yeah. was like horrific. <laughs> That's the <laughs> nightmare. Imagine. Like I do a lot of public speaking and teaching. And sometimes I do find my brain goes to that point yeah. where I'm like, imagine you just stop talking in front of these 50 people. Yeah, yeah. That I, I, yeah. And I still, <laughs> I've done it. I've done hundreds and thousands of hours of it. And I still get that feeling. It's such a human feeling. Yeah. But you lived your nightmare. Yeah, completely. So anyway, got got the water, struggled through the last uh, few, few minutes of the talk and got the hell off that stage. And I remember I was in the, the green room afterwards with one of my fellow speakers and I, you know, had my hands. I was like, I'd had a mare, you know, and he was trying to, you know, big me up and c- comfort me. And he's just like, I was like, that was terrible. And he's like, that no, was really good. Like, and especially the stuff you were, when you were talking about the wine, like people love that, you know, people are really into it. And I'd obviously just caught someone who either wasn't into it or just looked away or whatever. But in a room of 500 people, yeah, you're going to have 100 that are on their phone. Yeah, you're going to yeah. have 50 who are thinking about their dinner. You're going to have 50 who are like, I wish I hadn't agreed to come to this. Yeah. You know, you're going to have, but you're going to have 50 who are utterly hanging on every word. Yeah, completely. You can just, like, you just can't cater to 500 people. It's impossible. Yeah. No, for sure. And then I realized that, yeah, the bits that when I was talking about the wine and the winemakers and some of my trips and the, the stuff I discovered just came so easy to me. Mm. The bits when I was talking about the funding and the, how we got started, even though I wasn't kind of there for the, you know, the first two years. And you know, they're the bits that maybe I was less confident mm. speaking about. And I just realized that, you know, why don't I just focus on what I love and what I'm good at? And really be myself, mm. and less so on the stuff that I'm, I'm you know. And it's, uh, you know, w- when you reflect on it, it's exhausting trying to be someone that you're not. Oh, and yeah. e- everyone does it, especially you know, when they come into a new job or a new company. Yeah, you, know, you put on this facade and this this this, this, this character, which, which isn't you. And just I, I've learned that the the more you're authentically you, which sometimes means I haven't a clue what's going on here. Someone explain it to me, or you really double down on the stuff that you know you're good at. Uh, that can produce results. And I, I had to unfortunately go through that pretty tough experience to, to, to learn that. Um, and, you know, w- once I kind of hit that and realized, let's just be me and, um, and less of the other guy, um, you know, we, we, like we took off. And um, there's a huge lesson in that, though. Massively. I think you do, like, unfortunately, I think you do have to have those moments here, like, because we mimic each other, right? We mimic what we've seen before. Well, it worked for Eamon. I'm going to give it a shot and it's going to be just like Eamon. It can't go wrong if I'm just like Eamon. Whereas when you realise, oh, I just, because you have to hype yourself up beforehand. You have to get into the mode. and It's exhausting. You come off. And I, I've done the exact same thing. as you. I've, I've tried to like mimic styles of people. I'm like, God, I was terrified. Like you just, you get the cold sweat and get up there and you'd deliver and you'd stutter through and you'd, you'd have your slides behind you and you'd be standing reading the slides and <laughs> awful, awful stuff. But then if you just go, what you said there, I I don't know that. Yeah, It's so <laughs> liberating though when you go, you're not trying to pretend to be someone else who knows all the answers because no one really wants that. People want the authentic story. Yeah. They want the real you of, oh, I went to this vineyard and the car broke down and it was amazing though and they only do 100 balls. That's where the magic is, isn't it? The so, narrative. We talked about narrative already loads of times, but it's the narrative, isn't it? And you can't fake that, I don't think. But I think stepping into someone's shoes like you did, that's a very difficult challenge. That's why I was so curious to see how you did it. How soon did that realization drop? Yes. Uh, I mean, it probably took took that experience to, to, to realize it. And, you know, 
that f- from then, yeah, you just 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 being yourself was 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 yeah a, a real game changer. And yeah, we ended up you know growing the being part of the team that grew the business to three hundred thousand customers and hundred million turnover and you know two hundred fifty people. Um, so it was an incredible experience. And I guess you know, was their model like Winestrike? Was it wine subscription or what was it? It, it was a similar subscription model, um, but the way they did it was different. Um, and I kind of knew, you know, I was able to take learnings from from that business and you know take the good of it and the bad of it and and maybe you know create something which I, I thought had the, the the best of both worlds uh, with Winespark, which is what I've done. Were you ever tempted to stay with Winespark or go to the US or or stay with? Um Naked wines and go to the US, or what was the logical thing to come home was was family. I think yeah, the, the you know we had plenty of opportunities to to travel and and do lots of different roles. Um, but yeah, I think once you have kids and you realise that uh, yeah, home is where the heart is, and um, it's important to be close to kind of friends and family again. Um, had an amazing time in in the UK and really did well out of it. I think Irish people in general do do very well in the UK um, and. Uh, yeah, and having moved back here now, we're, we're really happy we did, albeit though we, we do miss our time over there. What lessons did you take from Rowan, studying under him and learning under him? What were the kind of key things you took with you? Uh, lots. Um, I, I think one of the one of the key things I took from Rowan and probably applied to, to, to my own business is Rowan was great at creating a a business scenario or a business model that suited all parties. So, you know, back when we started Naked um, in 2008, you know, the supermarkets dominated the wine industry. They, they still do to, to an extent. Um, but the, the problem with the wine industry was there was always someone getting screwed. Okay. So if you're a customer, um, you bought, you know, wine down the supermarket, the quality is not great. If you bought it in a nice wine shop, you're overpaying. Um, if you're a winemaker and you're working with the supermarket, they're going to hammer you in price. It's a pr- pretty tough relationship. So no one really is winning. And Rowan is great at creating business models and scenarios. He did it with, he did this with financial services back in the day. He did this with all, all these the, these industries where everyone won. You know, Naked was a model where customers got better wine for their money. Winemakers got cash flow up front and, you know, the paid on time um, and, you know, got to, got to make and sell, you know, more premium wines. And everyone and naked stood in the middle, you know, uh, uh, making a, a good cut as well. So everyone won. Uh, compared to the regular industry, where eighty five percent of wine is bought in the supermarket, it's yeah, you know, the quality isn't great, the prices are low. There's no real joy. You know, uh, one of the big supermarkets put out a, a job uh, a few years back for a wine director, you know, he- head of wine for, for for this supermarket, and it was a fifteen page job spec. You know, very technical. The word wine wasn't mentioned once. And that just illustrates, you know, what the what what that industry it's is more like. logistics more is it than, than actual wine. very technical, very yeah. logistics, very price driven. So not a lot of joy in it. So, um, yeah, c- you know, coming back here, I kind of realized, you know, I, I was maybe aim- I, I would want to aim at maybe a more premium uh, market. You know, no point, you know, starting a business trying to you know compete with compete with supermarkets. Also wanted to do something a bit different to Naked, so I ended a more maybe premium end of the market. It just so happened that, that they're, they're vastly underserved, like I said, you know, the, the intimidating choice and very high prices because of high margins. So how could I create a business model that would suit everyone? You know, customers subscribe to WineSpark for 10 euros a month. They get the wines at a 10% markup rather than the usual high margins you get everywhere else. And our winemakers um, get to, you know, make delicious wines they're proud of and, and sell them to an audience who really appreciate what they do. So it's just very different to what, like, the, the general wine industry is. So, yeah, that, I'd say there that that's the biggest lesson I took from I love from that, home. the win-win model. Because yeah. I think it goes against, you do the old style of business was, oh, you know, it's elbows out, you know, how, for me to win, you have to lose, like that old model. I think in general, that style of business is dying off. But I like the fact it was win-win. You did something there that's quite contrarian in terms of you went after the upper level market straight away as a young business. Most people do the opposite and try, you know, off oh, it's cheap, people give it a go. How did you come to that decision? I think it was, again, back to being yourself and being authentic. I have no interest in going to Italy and importing 12 containers of cheap Pinot Grigio. You know, I, I, I'm not passionate about that sort of product. I don't think that gives people pleasure. You know, it gives certain people pleasure on a Friday night, but in terms of like being a memorable product that stands out, mm-hmm. you know, there's, there's, no, there's no point doing it. So, um, and then there's the reality of, 
if you want to compete at a lower price point, you got to hit volumes fast to make the margins work. And in a small country, uh, you know, with, with much lower volumes, even than the UK, that that's just a very hard thing to do. Um, yeah, there's an interesting stat. I said 85% of people buy wine in the supermarket in the UK. That number is 65% in Ireland. Okay, so it's a smaller market, but a much bigger chunk of the market mm. buy outside of the supermarket, therefore online or you know wine shops or or, or, or wine chains. So there is a market there that um, you know it's a premium market. The prices aren't necessarily premium, so our prices start from fifteen euros a bottle. That fifteen euro bottle would cost twenty five in a normal wine shop. A thirty euro wine at Wine Spark would cost fifty at a wine shop. So you know you're giving people significantly better quality and value. Uh, but not necessarily for you know nice wine shop prices. It's actually you know people get get really good prices for what they do, what, what they're uh, what they're buying. And you know exactly who your customer is. That's there's such a power in that knowing exactly what your niche is. A lot of people try to serve to to serve every master. Hmm. They're trying to be all things to all people. Oh, we're the one stop shop for wines. That was kind of internet version one, right? Oh, Amazon. Hmm. Get any book you want in the world. Whereas I think clever business models like yours are emerging now. Whereby, nope. We are only for this subsection of a subsection. We're only for wine drinkers, and within wine drinkers, we're only for premium wine drinkers. I think there's a serious power in that. Yeah, but it's sure. ballsy. It's not easy. Like as a young company, the temptation is, I will figure it out later. Yeah. <laughs> How did you set up? Right, talk to me through. You, you started wine tastings on the street. You kind of had the business model and template, I guess, from naked. But how did you go about setting that up here in Ireland? Mm. And I think I think it goes back first of all to having that experience at a big company for ten years, and a lot of people get into wine and other these other passion projects where they just they're passionate about it, or they had a nice experience on holidays, or they want to buy a vineyard or something. You know, um, people don't realize the absolute hardest part about wine is selling it. <laughs> you know, uh, so. Yeah, working at a company for 10 years in the industry, doing every role from buying wine through to logistics, customer service, marketing, growth. You know, uh, you, you can't you can't buy that experience. You can't study that. You, you, it, it, it just becomes kind of ingrained in juice. So, so when it came to starting the business, I had a very strong idea, you know, um, about, you know, what I wanted to do. That was, you know, make these great wines more accessible and more affordable. There was a bit of an iteration around the business model, um, you know, how the mechanism, how I do that. And that's how I landed on the subscription. How were you going to do it? What was the first? Give me the raw, because that's what I love to give people insights. People are sitting at home now going, I want to start my business, but I've absolutely no scooby idea for the start yeah what was what did you think it was going to be and what did it become yeah version 1.0 of wine spark was a long way from what it ended up being <laughs> give me the um, juice because that's they're the bits they're the bits of people are like oh he's got it all together of course he knew what he was going to do 10 years in the business how could he go wrong yeah how did you go wrong i, I had this idea around creating like a, a bond f where people would invest in it and get money back in wine as opposed to interest oh clever i was only reading about bonds yesterday in the financial times I yeah. finally understand what a bond is <laughs> yeah exactly and it'd be kind of a bit of crowdfunding and all that stuff and so complicated quite complicated you know again in ireland it's, it's a small market i i had no name here i i my i struggled to kind of get traction on that and because the whiskey market's super popular here for that kind of stuff right yeah exactly and in theory you know red wine aged in oak barrels not dissimilar, you know, in terms of mm. the aging potential, how it accumulates value with age, all, all, all that stuff. I can but see where your logic went because you can't open a newspaper or open any kind of financial investment perspectives without seeing whiskey. Yeah. Whiskey, 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 whiskey. So exactly. was that where your thinking was going? Yeah, a little bit. Um, and then, you know, I have a group of business friends uh, who we, we, we meet uh, regularly and, um, you know, lots of people are entrepreneurs or run businesses or, you know, going through starting and, uh, and ending things. And one of the guys suggested a really good exercise, which was because two of us were starting a, a business at, at the same time. And we did a presentation for about 15 minutes, a deck, kind of the pitch deck uh, on the business. And we did a round the table afterwards, which was uh, give me one thing you loved about that idea and one thing you didn't like so much. And it was it's a really simple exercise. Um, it's but a good exercise. It's a really good one. I run something similar. So we do a monthly meetup and you kind of bring a challenge. Yeah. It's generally for people who are running businesses, but you bring a challenge and go, right, what's the one thing I'm trying to figure out? And you explain what you want the end goal to be, and you explain what you've tried, and then you sit to the side like you're not there. <laughs> and the four or five or five, six other people 
explain what they understood it to be and how they would tackle it. And just by getting that perspective, you're you're then sitting there. You can add no more. You can they can ask some follow up questions, but then once follow up questions are done, you sit there <laughs> and they discuss it like you're not there. I love those exercises because you become so wedded to an idea. I think. So, what were the pros and cons? What did people say to you? Yeah, I mean, it was I. It, it, I Kind of tore up the the business plan at that point. You know, got got, got really? good feedback. Wow. Yeah, in terms of yeah, it just wasn't a goer. Um, Why not? But you know, that bond idea was just just um, a, a load of rubbish in hindsight. <laughs> but you know, got the idea around the subscription, and you know, there's a few other companies and in, in other industries who, who do something similar. Um, and you know, playing on the good feedback I got, which was you are so passionate about wine, you really know your stuff. People would really trust your recommendations. Mm. You understand the economics of making wine and selling wine. Um, and then the less good stuff, which was the execution. So yeah, I knew I had the I had a, a lot of the, the the advantages, but but just needed a better kind of model and and, and execution. Um, and yet yeah, that, that that kind of morphed into the, the model the way it is uh, t- today. Um, and yeah, having done having run a big wine business for ten years, you understand how the logistics work. You need a warehouse, you need a website, you need good photography, you need a basic range covering Rioja to Australian Shiraz to New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc. So a lot of that stuff is kind of in your head uh, right. anyway. Um, I think that the big thing that you need is customers, right? And you know, this was like uh, I left Naked in January. Uh, I ended up launching in July, so six months later. Um, you know, I just, I told Naked in, in November um, w- w- what I was off to do. And, you know, I was the managing director at Naked for 10 years, uh, for the guts of 10 years. Um, I was also the person who signed off all the emails because I was the main person finding them around the world. So I'd been writing to 300,000 people for the best part of 10 years. How did it and work? I, there was like a newsletter that went out every week? It was a what? weekly newsletter. Okay. Personal from, from Eamon Fitzgerald, the wine guy. And it was about whatever the, the latest and greatest wine that I'd found. So I'd been writing these people for for for, for the, the guts of ten years. So it was only right then when I was leaving to say I'm off. Thanks for the support and the memories, you know, and um, kind of see you later kind of thing. And I just stuck in a PS at the end to say, oh, by the way, my new business is in Ireland. If you know anyone back there, you know, just love 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 to hear from them or you know, please keep in touch. And to that email, I got 5,000 individual responses what? Uh, from people saying, thanks so much for all the memories and, you know, um, thanks for all the wines. And 1,500 people said, yeah, I've got a cousin in Limerick or my best mate has just moved to Dublin. You know, here's their email address. Uh, you know, you, you um, they love to, you, they, they're all saying we'd love to, to find the equivalent of Naked back in Ireland. Like So I, I had a starting, you know, customer database of 1,500 people. Which meant that you know from kind of May onwards, when I built the just the the, the landing page pre-launch, where it's starting to collect uh, email addresses through to launch in July, it just meant that you know rather than day one switching on the website, nothing happens, which I think happens a lot. It's I call it's, it's called all the blank page problem. Yeah, you're sitting there and you're like, where do I even start? Yeah, and I think you that is a beautiful hack. It was, and I I mean I only threw in that PS last minute in the email. Just you know, and uh, the 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 support and the goodwill was was heartwarming. You know, for people to go genuinely fair play to you. You know, you're living your dream. You're going to do your own thing. Um, some lovely stories from people where you know the wine had played such an important mm-hmm. part in their lives. They had their last bottle with their partner during COVID before they passed away. You know, like some really like deep and uh, and meaningful meaningful stuff. But the overall. Uh, nature was of goodwill and, and, and good wishes. And by the way, here's here's my friend who, mm. who lives in Ireland and, and would love a new wine supplier. But people um, are, are are searching for that personal connection, I think, now, because, you know, in the modern world, there's a lot of disconnect between kind of media and people. And, mm. like, people, it's like the podcast, people create a bond because they're listening to you for maybe, like, three, four hours a week. Mm. They're reading your email every week for 10 years. They pretty much know you. They know a version of you anyway. There's that parasocial relationship going on whereby they feel like you're, they're your friend. There's a huge part of that. And newsletters are all the rage now. Newsletters are one of the hottest topics in business right now. Mm-hmm. Emails back in. Like who would have thought it 10 years ago when social was the thing, five years ago when social was taken over, whereas email is still incredibly powerful. So there's a good insight there, I think, for businesses listening to go, that's a direct relationship to my customer because with social, hit and miss. They yeah. might see the story. They might not. They might might get fed by the algorithm. They might not. Whereas email, it's going to their inbox. Fairly good chance to read it. Absolutely, and you have the chance to be personal with them, 
Um, I think the biggest mistake companies make with email is is treating it as a a corporate yeah. a mass broadcast. It's an you know, from a yeah. company. You don't want that. Um, my emails, they're plain text. They're addressed directly to the recipient. Um, you know, the the, the biggest. Um, the biggest, uh, the most important thing I think of when uh, I write an email is it's personal. And if you treat it as personal, if you, you know, write in my head to Gary, you know, who I'm looking at right, right now, telling it, telling him about my latest discovery, it ends up as, it, it ends up reading that way rather than, you know, a big sale or a discount. You know, people just don't respond as much to yeah. that in, in the long run. You know, you'll, you'll get a quick hit of sales. Um, so if you can write personally and authentically, you know, so my best emails that I write, you know, I do all of my sales, generate. we generate all of our sales through email, right? Um, and yeah, like you say, you know, out of fashion 10 years ago, email never really left because it's just an extension of communication, which, you know, goes back to the, the, the you know, carrier pigeons you know it's how did you learn to be a good writer though because that that all, all your sales comes through email that's mind-blowing how did you learn to be a good writer because yeah email makes sense but it's like anything it only makes sense if it's very good hmm. i think um like yeah always liked english in school and read lots i still read lots you know com combine it's important to combine I, I feel like you know read lots of business books but read a lot of fiction as well because mm. you just get that blend of languages yeah. what you put in comes out even stuff like reading you know people have a go at certain tabloids but if you, if you read the sun for example not that i do it often but like their english is amazing because they have a target market it's simple it's understandable mm. and you know if you just read lots of different sources i think what you put in comes out and then once you have that you then need to go experience the things that you're writing about so in my case I'll travel somewhere, you know, I'll spend time with a winemaker, I'll learn about the region, I'll, I'll always have my notebook in my pocket, taking notes, learning, you know, writing things down. Um, and, you know, some of my best emails, best performing emails are written on the plane on the way home from, you know, Madrid at nine o'clock at night. And I've had a, the most amazing day in a, uh, in a wine region. I'm probably still half cut from the, the lunch and the wine I had. But I'm just, you know, m my passion and, and my excitement is kind of peaked as I'm going home because I cannot wait to tell people about what I've just discovered. That's and magic. So you're a blend of kind of an explorer, a journalist, a writer and a businessman all blended together. And I think that's a beautiful insight. You need to experience the things you're writing about. Because I think online there's this temptation to just hop on trends, whatever is kind of cool. Oh, I'll write about AI. Yeah. Yeah, grand. Like you said, you might get an initial hit, but that passion has to be there. So I think for businesses listening, you have to be passionate and you have to experience new things. I think there's a lot of regurgitation of content, a lot of regurgitation of stories. I think you going out there every week and every month and finding new adventures to write about it comes through. Hmm. That's fantastic. I think it's like, you know, everyone's talking about AI at the moment, how it's going to take over the world and, uh, you know, eliminate jobs and humans and stuff. And, uh, and it may well do that, right? But, you know, only three years ago, we're all sitting on Zoom going, who needs face to face anymore? Mm -hmm. You know, we've got this, why are we wasting all this money traveling and going to meetings and stuff? And, you know, a couple of years later, you, you realize, no, <laughs> we need human interaction yeah. and authenticity. That's why we're sitting across from each other right now in exactly. a beautiful studio with lights and that's what you need. There's yeah. very little that can replicate this. Yeah, Zoom gets the job done sometimes, but you still need that human interaction. I, I look, I think AI is going to take over a lot of autonomous jobs. So a lot of stuff that's that should be automated anyway, but it doesn't get rid of humans. It frees humans up to do more higher value things. You cannot recreate M. Fitzgerald's journey to a vineyard from an airport in Spain and what you experienced, where did you stop? What did you do? You can't replicate that with AI. Yeah, I, w I was in Bierzo last year. It's this region north of Spain, uh, in the north of Spain. And there's a young winemaker there called Cesar Marquez. And his uncle is a very famous winemaker. Anyone who knows their Spanish wine will, will know who it is, Raul Perez. He's Spain's most famous winemaker. Cesar is his nephew. And he's only 31, 32, y y young guy. And um, everyone knows Raul Perez. Uh, Cesar has made wine with him since he was a teenager, right? So Raul's wines are amazing. They cost kind of 25 quid up to a grand a bottle, right? Um, says that while Raul, tra Raul travels all over Spain ma making uh, wines all over the place, Cesar's always back in the, in the winery on the end of the phone to Raul going, he'd do this, do that, you know. And uh, in 2015, then Cesar started his own uh, w winery and I picked him up two years ago at a wine fair and, you know, went out to visit him in, in Bierzo. 
and you know spending the day the day with them traveling around the vineyards and you know learning about you know what makes the grapes special and the, the combination of the land and the the wind and you know the, the the terroir as we say in wine and then back in the winery and we're tasting I taste about 45 barrels with them you know real this guy is hot property in terms of like he's the, the name on everyone's lips in spain but so so humble so generous with his time he'd be asking me in my opinion he's like is this got too much oak or is this good enough for the top blend you know asking me like i've no place or no like he's not going to take my uh you know m- my opinion is is whatever he, he's brilliant at what, what he does but his humility and his ambition you know to and you start to learn that like he, the reason he started his own business was he didn't want to live in the shadow of his uncle he loves his uncle loves his family but he wanted to make his own name for himself and you know when you learn that you know, here's an entrepreneur in his own right, mm-hmm. making incredible wines. And, you know, the fact that I, I got him before and anyone else did, and he can only get his wines with Wine Spark in Ireland at an amazing price as well. Um, they're, they're the little moments where you can only get that when you're with the person, yeah. you know, over several hours, learning their history, learning their motivations, and learning what makes their, their product taste incredible. Um, I think that's very interesting about his mindset there, because any of the great entrepreneurs or founders I've met, they have that growth mindset. They're just so curious. They listen a lot. They ask you questions, even if it's about the podcast or whatever. They're just curious to go, how does that work? Yeah. And what do you do with that? That's interesting. I've heard about this. They're just on that buzz of that mindset of curiosity. They're driven by curiosity and not ego. That's like exactly he, he could have a massive ego. He could have the biggest ego in the world. He yeah. could just take over, walk straight in, take over the family business, happy days, probably wouldn't have to work too much. But instead, he's out there grafting, creating his own path. And that's Completely. tough because he's, that shadow looms large, I'm sure, from his uncle. Like, that's huge. Yeah. And so many of the producers I work with, they're entrepreneurs in their own right. They might have left the family business or gone from a different career into winemaking. They tend to make wine in, you know, wine vineyards and wine regions. They're beautiful, but they tend to be quite remote. Some of the best wines come from these very harsh, remote areas in the likes of Spain and Italy and France. So it's, it's a hard life. Um, but a rewarding one knowing that they're making brilliant wines and that curiosity is usually what sets them apart you know wine regions tend to be centuries old and the locals made wine one way for all that time and still do for the most part today but it's those people who've that got the curiosity who might have traveled to other places who've who kind of take that feedback from their importers and their you know the people that c- come in and visit and do things just a little bit differently uh, you know, the results are in the product and they usually have a great story to tell as well. And that's that's my role. So you actively travel a lot then to go and find these kind of hidden gems. So how often are you away? Yes, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to be very well connected, you know, d- down the years. I'm gone every kind of six mo- six weeks uh, for a night or two. Um, it's a great way to obviously experience and, and, and find new wines and stories, but also it's a great way just to, I don't know, keep, keep, keep the balance with your life. You know, there's nothing better, you know, than having a great day, you know, in a vineyard, waking up early the next morning, going for a walk around a sleepy Italian village or, you know, a busy Spanish city as, a, as it wakes up and you're, you're just experiencing it. And it's just, you're out of, you know, Dublin, uh, out of the daily stuff. And then, you know, it's just that reset you need. And then you get back to the madness and uh, and the kids. And There's a big the power stuff. to that, I think, because I think a lot of us get disconnected from what we're doing because we've all these tech tools, because we can do a Zoom, because we don't really have to do that thing, the boots on the ground thing. I think there's a magic in that and a power to it. And it's probably what keeps you fresh. It, it definitely does. And it, it keeps your ear to the ground as well in terms mm. of what's new, what's what's hot, what's, you know, like you, you know, even take the, the, the basic economics of the wine industry, you know, in Bierzo, you know, you'd be, you'd be uh, this is this really um, uh, exciting wine region, northern Spain, some of the most expensive bottles in Spain are, are coming from this place. The the grape is called Mencia. It's like Pinot Noir, Burgundian style, kind of northern Rhone as well. Wines grow. You know, you you you'd be talking to the, the producer there. And it's like, right, how, how much are the how much are the grapes here? Uh, like on average, you know, in the valley, it's like a euro a kilogram, right? So, and a bottle of wine, a euro a kilogram means about 70, 80 cents of actual wine in the bottle. So, you know, in terms of, uh, and you go to this steep slope where all the most expensive wines selling for hundreds if not thousands of bottles like how much are the grapes off this slope it's like two euros a kilogram which is about 150 worth of yeah. wine in the bottle so it's like you realize then that you know you, you're getting all this intelligence all the time but you realize the gap between what people spend at the top end of the market versus what they actually cost to produce that gap is marketing 
Okay, mm-hmm. and what I'm trying to do is reduce that gap. Okay, but you only learn and understand these things the more you kind of get out there and talk to people. And I guess back to your your, your point around curiosity as well. Um, so it it kind of serves serves its purpose when when you get out in the road like that. So year two, what's kind of been landmarks you've kind of gone? Ooh, that's that's a big one. As mm-hmm. when you were kind of sat back, because I think when you're in early in the journey, you kind of just the head down is grinding. Yeah. And you, but you seem like a very self-aware dude. So I'm kind of guessing there was moments where you just kind of took your head back and went, "Oh, that was that was a nice little one to hit." Yeah, you're always you're always yeah. I mean, year two, you're looking for any wins because they seem to those wins seem to come easy <laughs> in year one because you're new. Um, we recently crossed the one hundred thousand bottles shipped marked, Oof. which that's uh, huge. Felt like a big uh, big achievement. You know, two years on from standing outside my house in Dunleary with you know a little kids' table in front of me and pouring some kind of unlabeled bottles of wine from my from my neighbours, um, so yeah, hundred thousand bottles of wine is is you know when you, you yeah as entrepreneurs I think you, you can be quite self critical and uh, all that stuff yeah you do need to s- step back from time to time and kind of maybe just go right that was that's pretty good and then you you move on to the next uh, raging fire but. Um, yeah. It's important though, isn't it? It's it's. I, I think it, entrepreneurs don't do that. I think it's just inbuilt in us to be like forward, forward. I think it's fear. I think I've I've thought about this a lot as I've chatting to entrepreneurs, afraid to stop, mm. afraid to kind of smell the roses because it could all go away in the morning, and it very well could. But it's trying to find that blend, isn't it? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Um. Again, v- very hard to. But yeah, you you do learn. I guess you know, in my last job as well, like you got to celebrate the wins when they come, and I feel like. As a founder, as an entrepreneur now, compared to, you know, when I was the, the, the MD of my previous company, it wasn't my business. Those wins just are so much harder to come by. They're much harder fought. Therefore, they are more, sat- more satisfying. And they're sweeter, them right? Off. Yeah. They're sweeter. The, 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 what, what do you do to grow the business? Because obviously you had, a, you had a good tailwind to start with, which was incredibly smart of getting the emails. What's, what's kind of like your strategy for growing? Because I like to leave people kind of tangible things they can apply to their business. Hmm. Um, what tactics are working for you in terms of getting co- in front of customers? Yeah, um, so word of mouth is huge for me. Um, I always looked, you know, I had lots of data to play with back back in the naked days. And, you know, we looked at our, I always looked at our highest, a cohort of highest value value customers. And, you know, the people who spent the most, who ordered, ordered the most frequently, who, who stayed around the longest. And the one thing that they had in common was they were f- referred to the company by their friend. Okay, they didn't come through s- some deal or some discount off, you know, uh, off an online ad. Um, so that you know, that's why I thought. Well, you know, starting WineSpark, um, let's build a company around word of mouth. Therefore, you'll have the best quality customers, and, and thankfully, that that's what I've seen. The, the metrics look, look look spectacular so so far. Uh, then that obviously, uh, you know, the next question is how do you do that? And you know, again, thanks. Ha- having, <laughs> yeah, ha- having had that ten years experience, and and you know, I remember surveying customers back in the day. You know, our best customers on our NPS survey, the Net Promoter Score. You know, what are the things that our highest pr- our highest promoters love most about the company two things very simply wine and service okay so product obviously needs to be good and service delivery um customer service when things go wrong need to be spectacular the interesting thing it makes sense but the interesting thing about that were they both need uh, the response to that survey wine was service was as important as wine so you know people it's the less glamour side next day delivery mm. it's free for members uh, really good customer service um Less glamorous side of the business, but you know when those when things go wrong, you pick it up and and, and, and people then tell their friends a, about you. So, really getting the basics right. It doesn't sound uh, it doesn't sound the most complex, but you know having good service is rare though. Like yeah. this, this this seems mad to say, but like we're always like I'm always looking for insights here in the pod and like good service. Like mm. when was I I do a, a teach an entrepreneurship class in Trinity and. Before I start, we talk, we talk about kind of like you know, marketing communications, you know, promotion, blah, 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 blah. And I go, okay, before we start, tell me about the last time you had incredible service. Mm. And generally, people are blank for like a good 30 seconds. And they're like, oh, there was this one, you know, only one. Like, mm. it's wild because day to day, you're kind of used to this kind of okay service. Mm. But when you get it, damn, you're loyal. Yeah, you're there's loyal the, to that. Place. There's a great book called I read, read it early days in Naked, very formative in terms of my kind of management style, how I ran things around there. Called If Disney Ran Your Hospital, 
Um, it's written, definitely never heard of that one. Yeah, it's very good. I, I don't even know if you can get it on Kindle. It's quite an old book, but the principles are, are it, there, there's gold dust in them. Um, so it was a hospital consultant in a private hospital over in the US uh, who was wanted to improve patient satisfaction. So he went to Disney, uh, Disney Resort, to figure out how they did it. And the biggest learning he took away from it was Disney used to survey customers at the end of their stay to say, how, how much did you love to say, rated out of five stars. And Disney noticed that customers who rated the, fi- the experience five stars were twice as likely to rebook versus those who rated it four stars. Okay. And I, you know, at the time of Naked, I had, we asked our customers the same question. How was the service you received today from the agent? Um, but we only rewarded our our agents, our, cust- our customer happiness team, as we called it at the time, based on four and five star service. So if they did a pretty good job, they'd get their their bonus and their their, their incentives. Um, our five star service rate at the time was sixty five percent. So I said, well, what what would happen if we changed the target from five stars only instead of four and five? And um, and we also looked. We also saw the retention f- numbers were doubled for people who received that five star service. So we changed the the target from positive four and five just to five stars, and it shot up to eighty five percent in two weeks. And the retention and the the the, f- the frequency pulled up as a result as well. So it created a culture of just you know just people going above and beyond f- for the customer, th- rather than the these agents being traditionally the kind of bottom of the barrel in, the co- in any company because they're just doing service. They became the frontline heroes of the company. And we just built an amazing company uh, culture around brilliant service, and uh, it was all based on that 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 book that I read. So that's a phenomenal insight. Yeah. The difference between four and five star service, there's a great phrase I love, show me your incentives, I'll show you your outcome. I love that. So you just change the incentives of the customer service agents so that the default five star. Yeah. That's what we're going for. That's the standard. I talked to you about the the pod, that's why we moved into the cinema. We want it to be world class. You know, if you aim for world class, even if you get nine tenths of the way there, you've gone a long way. Yeah, for sure. Um, and then the other things around, um, yeah, trying to get, you know, word, driving word of mouth, you know, uh, press is important. Uh, you know, I, I'm a believer that you should be more targeted uh, in your, you know, you, you're, mm-hmm. we've had some great articles in the Irish Times, in the Currency, in the Business Post. Um, so rather than kind of just spraying and praying and pu- putting it everywhere, um, really important that, you know, identify your target customers, what they read, what they listen to, where they hang out. And then who are the people already speaking to them? Because mm. it's very hard yards trying to build that database. Yeah. You know, I got a kick at the start, but then trying to trying to grow it organically yourself is is hard yards. And then the third piece is LinkedIn. Um, so my number one uh, traffic source from social channels is LinkedIn. I'm a massive um, fan of LinkedIn. And, yeah, it's a sleeper hit. Like exactly. I get, we got a hundred thousand video plays last month on LinkedIn. Wow. Yeah. That's great. Bananas. Yeah. yeah. But yeah. like people go, oh, LinkedIn, it's so boring. Yeah. People have this thing about it. I hate it, blah, blah, blah. It's incredibly powerful. And it's the only social media I use that has serious organic juice. Massively. And again, back to the point of where your target listeners or customers hanging out, you know, spending most of their time online, it's probably going to be LinkedIn versus TikTok or, you know, depending on obviously the audience. But certainly wine drinkers tend to be professionals and, you know, the LinkedIn is the place to do it. So, Posting regularly on that, again, just authentic, honest content, whether it's wine discoveries or business learnings, uh, drives traffic to the site, and that, that, they, that turns into customers, which is, which is great. That's phenomenal. I think it's insights like that that I absolutely love to get. What's kind of the next kind of six to 12? You're, you're into year, going into year three now. Mm-hmm. What's your kind of goal? What are you looking to hit this year? Yeah, so um, very much um, continuing to obviously improve the business, grow the range of wines. Um, you know, whatever I do, I want to make sure that it doesn't uh, impact on the co- the overall customer experience and the member experience. Um, so I have a lot of work to do, you know, growing the, the membership base, growing the wine range. Um, and, you know, eventually you know, I'd love to build a foothold in Ireland to allow myself to, you know, expand internationally. Um, getting ripped off buying premium wine isn't a uniquely Irish problem. It's a problem the world over. And, you know, you can buy great wine everywhere. It just so happens that 
places like Bordeaux and Burgundy have 200 years of, uh, you know, marketing clout ahead, ahead, ahead of other places. Therefore, people are overpaying for premium wine everywhere. So mm. it's a model that applies in Ireland just as much as it does in the UK and, uh, and elsewhere. So the idea is to, yeah, gr- grow it here, build it here, ha- have, have a healthy, vibrant membership base here and potentially take it abroad from there. Um, I won't be pushed into doing that, uh, you know, ahead of time. You know, um, I'm lucky to have investors behind me who are uh, suppliers rather than traditional uh, investors. And they Wait, are, what do you mean suppliers? So how did you fund this business? So, um, yeah, I think uh, back in day one, obviously you n- needed a bit of money to get started. I did what everyone does, I think, which is dial up a few uh, angel investors or VCs or, or people who've got a bit of cash. And yes, straight away, I, I kind of, you know, based on some of the conversations I had, I, I realized that um, the, the, you know, the tone and the directions of some of the questions I was getting, like, you know, when are you going to, you know, how fast can you grow? And when are you going to supply restaurants? And when are you going to launch in the US? Like, one, a bit too fast. I hadn't even, like, I just barely put the business plan together. And two, totally at odds with, um, with you know, w- w- what's best for the customer. It's a great there's a great uh, quote by Sam Walton, uh, who's founded Walmart, uh, who said, um, "There's only one, there's only one boss in business. It's the customer, and he can fire everyone from the chairman down by taking their business elsewhere." And I think, particularly in direct to consumer businesses, where if you've got you know investors behind you, um, you can end up working for the investor rather than the customer. Um, and you know, in my experience, you look after the customer the investor will be fine. So, you know, very, very soon, you know, talking to some some of the more traditional sources, I realized, you know, maybe this wouldn't be optimal for, for, for me or for the customer. Um, and also the realization that, you know, I'd worked for someone for 10 years and the minute you take other, someone else's money, you're working for someone again, right? Um, so That's if you're a gonna- huge insight though. <laughs> so many people think money will solve my problem, an investor will solve my problem, They'll know what to do. Once they get the money, all the problems go away. Very rarely has someone sat in front of me and said those things mm. before. They've always said it after, going, if I knew now, what I knew if I knew then what I knew now, I'd never taken the money. Like for you to be able to do that prior is, is it's probably the key differentiator between your business and why we're sitting here today. Yeah. I mean, if if you if you're craving that freedom that entrepreneurship gives you, don't take any money, right? Bootstrap. Do it, do it yourself, and then you will genuinely have the freedom. If you have to raise money, which a lot of people do, try and raise it from the people that will be most aligned with the long term outcome of your business, and that's either customers or it's your suppliers. Okay, and I looked at it going, I don't have a name in Ireland. I've worked in the UK for ten years. No one knows who I am. I wouldn't have much traction from customers, I reckon. So the next best group was my suppliers, which are my winemakers. So I managed to cobble together fourteen of some of the world's most respected winemakers. And this is just off the back of COVID, so they'd probably sold a lot of wine during that time because everyone's stuck at home. Um, so I had a, a bit of spare cash uh, knocking about, so I raised 350k to get the business started. If you look at winemaker, you know, anywhere like Rioja, for example, you know, these people make investment decisions whether they're buying a tank for their winery or a piece of land, you know, or some vineyard. They're long-term decisions. They're often, you know, not trying to make a book, a quick book in three to five years' time. It's to pass on to their kids or their family, right? And obviously, you know, we're, we're aiming for a, a quicker turnaround than that. But, you know, they bought, they invested in WineSpark instead of, you know, buying a patch of land, for example. But what so, a beautiful way to think about business. Yeah. Like, and, I, and we don't think about that, way. you know, thinking quarters, so we think in, hmm. oh, years. But what a beautiful way to think about your business, especially as a young entrepreneur, especially as someone starting out going, right, long term, what's the best strategy here and who is most aligned? What did the suppliers say when you <laughs> rang them up? You're like, random one for you. Like, is this a done thing in the industry or how did how did you even come up with this? Yeah, I haven't. I mean, in terms of done thing, uh, apparently it was a big thing back in the 80s in Japan where like uh, electronics manufacturers, car manufacturers would get their suppliers to invest. There's a Japanese term for it. I'm not sure what it is, but when suppliers invested in, in, in their, their end consumers as like a... It's just the ultimate alignment. So Yeah, it's brilliant. Yeah, listen, when I picked up the phone to my winemakers, I was surprised and enthused at how uh, excited they were about it. And and I think that a lot of it was I'd helped them, a lot of them over the last mm. 10 years, and th- helped them grow their business and, and all that stuff. So 
there there was a little bit it was nice to maybe for them to to return that support and and get it back in and knowing me and knowing my track record i think they had a lot of confidence that it would be a, a safe bet comes back to that pedigree thing doing your reps 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 so, yeah. people forget about it. a lot of it is just reps doing being consistent I hate people who are like up one day, down the next, up one day, down the next. Ring him today. Well, how are you getting on a grant? Ring him tomorrow. What do you want? Like yeah. I hate that kind of like that short termism, whereby your pedigree was shown over ten years, so that when it, when it came to the crunch, you had that juice. You're able to pull that power out. Yeah, yeah. And like you know, they give me good prices, and it's a route to market for them as well. For a lot of the people in into Ireland, they give me great prices on the wines, which then I can obviously pass through to customers. Customers benefit, give me good payment terms again, can, so which, which helps the cash flow. If I need a new winemaker from France or Chablis or somewhere, you know, pick up the phone. I've got 14 people who have got a great network themselves. If I don't have a network, n- network. so um, all that stuff benefits the customer. And How did just, you think of doing that? Where did you get the idea to go suppliers might? Um, some cash. Yeah, I picked up the phone to Rowan. <laughs> well, after my first few uh, conversations with with other investors, and he said, Eamon, you've worked for me for 10 years. I know you're craving that that independence. So my first advice is don't take any money at all. Uh, but if you have to, uh, take it from people who are going to be most aligned with you in the long term. Love it. But isn't that the power of, of having people in your corner? Like, would you see him as kind of like a mentor? Yeah, very much so. Yeah, we, we catch up regularly. Um, it goes both ways, you know. Um, he was very good to me, taking me on, giving me a chance when not, no one else would have, but he, he put me in charge of his business, age 26, which not many people would do, but he, he must have liked something about my attitude and, and what I'd done already. I, you know, I, I paid him back in spades, d- did a good job for him. So very healthy relationship that works both ways. I like um, that, a peer network. It's not, you know, mentor to mentee. It's a peer network after a while. Yeah, yeah. And I think men- mentoring is, is kind of tough in that, uh, you know, if you just have a mentor or mentee and just catching it up every month or two on the phone or meeting for coffee, it's, it's very hard to build that mm. constant, that, that relationship, that trust. It's useful, but you cannot be working with someone in the trenches mm. over a long period of time. Um, and, you know, I would, I, would, I would have those similar relationships with former colleagues as well where I go to them for advice and vice versa. And um, it, it's just invaluable. Uh, so, yeah. Eamon, we're going to do our quick fire round. What book would you recommend every entrepreneur should read? So, uh, one book that I uh, really enjoyed back in the day was Delivering Happiness by Tony Shea. Mm. He's the guy who founded Zappos. Yes. And again, earlier on in my career, um, just, yeah, the importance of creating a strong company culture and that culture being centered around amazing customer service to people. Uh, I think it was hugely powerful. Um, if you're in maybe a less consumer facing business, uh, Good to Great by Jim Collins. It's just an amazing book. I think page per page, the value you get, you know, it's incredible. It's, it talks about leadership, talks about, uh, you know, conviction and, you know, the business model and, and, you know, hiring people, the right people before you figure out the right strategy. And it's all backed up by evidence. You know, a lot of business books are quite waffly and, mm. you know, a bit, bit They're vague. padded out, yeah. Yeah, uh, good to great, just amazing stuff. Yeah, I, I think we've only had that once before, so okay. I'll put that back on the top of the list. What's something you didn't pay attention to enough early on and had to learn the hard way? Um, I think y- 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 cash flow, uh, you know, going from running someone else's business to running your own business. If you screw up cash flow when you're, you're an employee, you might lose your job. And that's bad, but you, it's just your job. If you screw up cash flow running your own company, you could lose your business. Um, so you can never understand the, <laughs> the stresses and uh, pressure that you know keep keeping enough cash in the bank. Uh, as a, you can only understand it as a, if it's your own business, your own livelihood. Um, so that that's definitely a, a learning which I didn't understand earlier in my career, and I very much understand it now. <laughs> What's the one thing you've sacrificed for your success so far? Um, I'd say friendships, um, you know, in terms of like the hierarchy of like what's what's burning and what's kind of most, what, what's the highest priority at any given time. It's your children followed by your business, followed by your family. And, you know, unfortunately, friends, the, the good ones will always be there for you. Mm. Um, but it, it, it's just, a, I think a lot of entrepreneurs would, would say, you know, the, in, the, in those lonely times, you know, the, the, the friends kind of get um, sacrificed a little bit. 
and it, it just means yeah you, you, you figure out who you, who your real friends are um and the ones that stick by you um through it but yeah it's you, you do miss out on things for sure um and it is a it, it is tough but um yeah, th- th- that's just that's, that's life <laughs> i'm going to give you 10 million euros today what are you going to do with it well, um, I've always said if Wine Spark is a success, um, how I know it'll be a success is I've dug a big hole under my house and built an amazing wine cellar. Um, so, um, if we can fast forward that 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 income, um, I would I, I'd do that. Um, that wouldn't cost ten million, but filling it uh, with good wine might. <laughs> so that that's what I do. It's the ultimate passion. That's probably the best <laughs> answer we've had so far. What's something that's incredibly important to you in your daily routine? Um, I go to CrossFit most mornings. Um, so I start the 6.15 class, start my day with that. And uh, yeah, just getting the exercise done, over and done with nice and early. And, you know, uh, a lot of my best thinking and ideas come when I'm stuck on the rower for five minutes with nothing else to do. Um, so, uh, yeah, that, that, I, I, couldn't, I couldn't remove that from my, my mm, life. Same exercise is fundamental. It's the core part of my day. If I give you one million euro today, how would you invest it? Um, I would probably invest it in some high-end wines from the likes of Burgundy and Bordeaux. So it's not my world in terms of what I kind of buy and sell right now or drink because I don't have the money for it. But, you know, um, throughout history, there will always be people willing to to, to, to pay for them and, and overpay for them. Um, these Some of these chateaus and properties of hundreds of years of brand value behind them. So mm. they're not going anywhere anywhere anytime soon. The only challenge potentially is, you know, if the world keeps, climate keeps going the way it is, some of these pla- wines and wineries won't exist in 30, 40 years. It'll just be too hot, which will make them even more valuable than the wines um, uh, that you buy now and um, then. So uh, that's probably what I'd do. Good answer. If you had to start a new company in the morning, what would it be? That's a tough question because I am doing exactly what I love doing. I thought that, yeah. I thought this would be, but we're going to put you in the spot. You have to start a brand new one. You have to leave wine behind. Listen, I love writing um, still. Uh, and no matter what the topic, I see terrible writing everywhere uh, in terms of like in marketing. Uh, in So uh, whether it's a copywriting agency not a, uh, or like a journalist or like a reporter or like a travel kind of reporter. Something I could see you as a travel writer. I could yeah, see that. Something about writing about nice stuff that makes people act on it. What do you believe that other people would strongly disagree with or find strange? Um, I think you should always hire for attitude over experience. So you can teach experience. You can't teach attitude. So, you know, when you look at, C- uh, at a CV, it'll only tell you so much, but it's, it's, it's when you're working with people their attitude will sign, shine through, and if they're good enough, they'll 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 learn it and they'll get the experience pretty quick. Um, so always always favor attitude over experience. This is the, probably the easiest question I can give you all day. In your personal life, what's the one thing you spend money on that brings you a lot of <laughs> happiness or joy? Do you think I'm going to say wine? Of course. <laughs> well, I don't. Uh, thankfully, I don't have to spend much money on wine because <laughs> it's always sent to me. But uh, wine glasses. <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> so, okay. Uh, no, good wine glasses. Um, you know, those really kind of brittle ones that you'd get in a nice restaurant. Um, I think y- if you're drinking wine out of them, you'll get about 30% more enjoyment out of the wine. Really? The fire of the glass, the, the more... Go on, the what's your you... wine? We'll go super niche here. This is going to appeal to 0.1% of the audience. <laughs> what's your favorite wine glass? Well, I think a lot of the audience will live near a nice wine shop. Okay. Uh, we don't stock wine glass ourselves, but like if you go down there and spend 30 or 40 quid on a glass, it sounds crazy, but from like a Zalto or a nice Riedel glass... Uh, if you're buying nice wines anyway, you may as well enjoy them in nice glasses. So that's my one indulgence that that I kind of enjoy. Um, the other one is good coffee. Um, so um, ma- making nice coffee at home, I can't drink bad coffee. So uh, really I'm with you on that, that one. Right. Yeah, I'm with you on that one. I kind of have to add in an extra question here because I feel I should have asked it earlier. What's your favorite wine? Uh very hard to answer that. I think um, it's like saying, "What's my favorite child?" Give um, me a couple, I, top three, even. I love. So you're heading to Spain, yep. um, on holidays. You'll be driving down through Burgos, uh, Ribera del Duero. Uh, it's northern Spain. It's uh, the wine is made from the Tempranillo grape. It's a really dark, 
like rich, inky, kind of herbaceous flavors, amazing with steak. There's this little lamb restaurant um, in a small town called Lerma. It's kind of halfway between San Sebastian and Madrid, a little medieval village in the middle of nowhere. Um, we have a vineyard nearby that I, I've been visiting for years, and there's a little lamb restaurant in this village. Um, it's called Casa Anton, and you walk in, and um, it looks very unassuming, checkered tablecloths, some old fellows kind of sitting around the place, flies buzzing around. You sit down, and there's no menu, no no kind of airs or graces about the place, and within about five minutes, a big tray of um, roast lamb, it's like plopped in front of you, uh, crusty bread and, and, a, and a, a side lettuce, a uh, side of lettuce. And the lamb is called let- lechusa. Um, it's 60 days old, only ever fed, fed milk, slaughtered the day before you eat it, and roasted in its own juices for uh, for six, five or six hours over vine wood in these clay ovens. And the wine they bring out is this local dark coloured rosé in goblet glasses from the local cooperative. And that wine, which on its own would taste rough as anything, but with that food in that setting, is the best wine you'll ever taste, right? And um, they're the sort of, it's like, you know, what's your favorite wine? It's like, what's the favorite? What's Where, favorite? Am I? Where am what I? Am I what am I doing? What am I eating? What, exactly. Yeah, beautiful. I love that um, answer. So. What's your one final piece of advice to every entrepreneur or aspiring entrepreneur out there? So my final piece of advice in three short words is go for no. Um, so personally, I'm as I said, I'm a bit of an introvert. Uh, I don't love pulling myself out there. But as an entrepreneur, you have to. You've no choice not to. I don't love dealing with rejection, all that stuff. Um, I read a good book called Go For No uh, recently, and I really changed my thinking around it. So rather than trying to maybe avoid those situations where you're going to get a no or going to get a rejection, actually, the more you put yourself out there and the more no's you get means you are putting yourself out there and you are, you know, and eventually one of those no's will, will turn into a yes. So, you know, if you're, you know, it, it, the, the, obviously there's nowhere to hide as an entrepreneur there kind of can be in a bigger company where you can focus on your strengths and hide your weaknesses um you know, it's a great mechanism to go the more no's i'm getting in a week or a month the actually more i'm putting it myself out there and it's just totally necessary it's, it's part of the game is uh, you know starting your own business so. what a way to finish i love that i love that I, we're, we're quite similar i'd be quite introverted as well and i love that idea of just push the boundaries a little bit more and go for no Eamon, that was a fantastic chat. Where can people learn more about Winespark? Uh, so, yeah, head over to winespark.com. Uh, I'd love to have you as a member. Um, and you can get me on LinkedIn, Eamon Fitzgerald. And we're on Instagram, at Winespark as well. Eamon, thank you so much. Thanks, Gary. And that was my chat with Eamon Fitzgerald. If you've hung around to the end, thank you very much. You can click here to subscribe to the channel, or you can click here to watch last week's interview. I'll see you back here in a couple of days for a brand new interview.